Welcome to Sagebrush Church. We're so glad you're joining us today. Here at Sagebrush, we exist to know Christ and to make Christ known. And if you haven't done so yet, head over to sagebrush.church slash hello so we can send you a little gift. We have some exciting news. On Friday, June 25th, Sagebrush Music is excited to release our version of Waking Up by We the Kingdom. available everywhere and you can listen to the music this Friday, June 25th. Did you know we have an app? Check out the New Testament reading plan where Pastor Todd has made it even easier for us to follow along and read the entire New Testament. This summer we have exciting things ahead for all of our kids and students at Sagebrush. X Camp and Remix Rally are back for 2021 and better than ever. Spaces are filling up fast, so register your student now at sagebrush.church slash xcamp and sagebrush.church slash rally. Today we are continuing our series called Text, where we're taking a deeper look at the Bible. This week's topic is how do we know the Bible is reliable? It's made up of 66 books with 40 different authors, so how do we know that what we have today is what people read all those years ago? If you find yourself having these types of questions, today's message is for you. Service is about to begin, so stand up to your feet and turn up the volume as we get ready for some worship. Welcome, we're so glad you've joined us, whether via television or the online stream or here in the room. Last week, we kicked off our brand new series, Text, and over the next few weeks, we'll be addressing questions that so many of us have about the Bible. Last week, we learned about the terrible persecution that so many endured so that we can have access to the Bible in many parts of the world today. For me, it was a stirring reminder to not take it for granted, to cherish it, and to actually read it for myself. Today, we're gonna be speaking about the reliability of the Bible, but first, we get to sing. So whether you're at home or you're here in person, I invite you to stand with us right now and give our very best to God who has given his best to us. Let's pray. God, we are here for you. I pray that you'd remove all distractions, that you'd help us to focus on your goodness and just who you are. You are so great and you deserve everything we can give. Amen. Let's sing. Oh, the weight of his glory. Oh, the wonder of his grace, the power of salvation. Oh, that pulled me from the grave. This hope is not empty. And forever he will reign. And he won't be put to shame. Oh, praise again from the moment of rescue I have never been the same when his love took me captive and my sin was washed away now I stand here forgiven and I know that I am saved and I won't be put Oh
remember that his name will make a way he'll make a way from the cross to the grave he is risen and he reigns praise the lord and sing his praise again can you remember how our god has never failed never failed us remember
a creature, the breath of all mankind, and you began your promises are written in creation everywhere i look i see a plan even the rocks cry out so i'll cry out heaven and earth will sing so i'll sing holy holy
scripture of miracles that you've done, of you parting the Red Sea, of you feeding 5,000 people out of a meal meant for one, giving sight to blind men, and God, best of all, raising Jesus from the dead. How easy is it for us to read those things and to forget the things that you've done in our life? God, that you've done the same thing for us, that you've brought us from death to life. Thank you for that love and that kindness. We pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. Well, thank you for singing with us. You can take a seat. Today is a day where we celebrate fathers. So happy Father's Day to everybody that plays the role of dad.
there all night Lying there in bed listening To his newborn baby cry He makes a pot of coffee Splashes water on his face His wife gives him a kiss And says it's gonna be okay It won't be like this for long One day we'll look back laughing At the week we brought her home His face is gonna fly by So baby just hold on It won't be like this for long Now that we have all the dads crying, won't be like this for long. Happy Father's Day. Hey, let me pray for the dads. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the dads and those who play the role of a dad, for the difference that they've made in our lives, in the lives of their family. Lord, I pray that you would bless them, that you would strengthen them, that you would help them, that you would give them wisdom to be the men, to be the dads, to be the husbands that you have designed for them to be. Lord, I pray that they would continue to pursue you with everything that they've got, that they would love you with all their heart and all their soul and all their mind and all their strength. They would be godly men that would always make your word the true north of their life, that you would be the one who leads them and guides them. So God, I lay them before you and I ask that you would do exceedingly abundantly more in and through their lives than anything they've ever dreamed or imagined. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to welcome everybody today. We are in the middle of a series called Text. We're talking about today the reliability of the Bible. Can we be certain that the Bible that, we, that was written so many years ago is the Bible that we have today? But before I get into that, I want to make a reminder to you, parents of elementary school kids, make sure you sign them up for X Camp. They've been waiting for this moment for two years. Use the Sagebrush app. Register your child. Also, if you have a teenager, register them 
for the Remix Rally. Andy Mino is going to be in concert. People have asked us, they called this week, how can I get concert tickets for Andy Mino? I'm not a teenager anymore, but I want to come to the concert. They're $15. They're at the door. So you'll pay at the door. That'll help us out an awful lot. But make sure you get your teenager signed up. One more thing I want to make mention before I get into the message. Salt. You might not even know we even have this as a church. This is the Sagebrush Academy of Leadership Training. These are online courses. That means I don't care where you live. If you're somewhere on planet Earth, you can take one of these online courses. If you want to know more about the Old Testament, the New Testament, more about doctrines, more about theology, more about practical Christian ministry. Hey, you say, I'm not interested in becoming a minister someday, but I am interested in those topics. You can sign up for a course. They're online. They're $50 each. Just go to the Sagebrush app, click the banner that says salt, and you'll get all of your information right there. All right, let's get into the message today. Can we trust the reliability of the Bible? There was a little boy, his name's Tommy. He was over in Kids Planet one Sunday, and they were teaching him how God created everything, that God created the heavens and the earth, God created the universes, God created the planets and the stars, God created all the animals, God created you, God created me, and Tommy was just absolutely blown away that that had taken place. And then they explained that when Adam was the first person that God created was in the Garden of Eden, there was no helper suitable for him. And so God put Adam into a deep sleep, took a rib from the man's side, and he fashioned, he formed a woman from the rib. Tommy had never heard that story before. His eyes were as big as I was like, wow, that's amazing. God can make a woman out of a rib. Later that week, he was home, and he wasn't feeling very well. Tommy was laying on the couch. His mom walked over to him. She said, Tommy, what's the matter? Tommy said, I've got a pain in my side. I think I'm having a wife. (laughs) (laughs) Friends, around here, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And if we were to do a poll, probably the large majority of those at home watching, those here in the room would say, absolutely, Todd, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. My life has been changed by the Bible. I memorize, I meditate, I study, I read the Bible. I love the Word of God. And yet there are some of us here today and some of us at home that say, you know, I, 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 I love the Bible, but I'm not sure it's accurate. I'm not sure that what was written, you know, thousands of years ago is the same thing that we have today. I mean, I mean, come on, isn't it kind of like a bad game of telephone? Do you remember playing the game telephone when you were a kid? You, you had a bunch of kids in a room, and somebody would whisper a sentence into one kid's ear, and then that kid would turn around and share it with another kid, and we'd go all the way down the road to the very end, right? And then at the very end, we'd say, well, what did you hear? And it'd be completely different from what they heard up here. And so we think, well, that must be the way it was with the Bible, because the Bible took thousands of years to be compiled. Thousands of years have gone by from when it was written to what we actually have today. So I'm sure there's additions, there's subtractions. And I understand why you might feel that way. There, There was an elderly couple, and they were celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. The family and the friends threw him a surprise party. And the husband was so overwhelmed, so blown away, that he decided to do an impromptu speech. So he stood up, calmed everybody down. He said, listen, when my wife and I, we started out 50 years ago, we didn't really know how it was going to go. But then he turned to his bride of 50 years. He said, but you've been tried and true. Well, she was kind of hard of hearing. She said, what? He said, you've been tried and true. She said, what? He said, you've been tried and true. She said, I'm tired of you too. (laughs) Friends, if we can't get it right in the same room, how do we expect that they got the Bible right way back when? Well, I've got great news for you today. There's evidence. There's evidence upon evidence upon evidence that what we have today is what they wrote way back then. So let's say you have a friend, friend comes up, you're talking about the Bible, talking about spiritual things, and they say, I don't know, I'm not sure about that Bible. I I think there's been changes, additions, subtractions over the years. I'm not sure the Bible we have today is the Bible. What would you say? Well, you would point to these four evidences. The first thing you would look at is manuscript evidence. 
Whenever we talk about an ancient document, we're always looking at all of the scrolls, all the parchments we have concerning that ancient document. And there are people that have studied this, and they have come up with the handwriting and the different kinds of parchments that things were written on, and they can come up within 25 to 50 years of when that document was actually written. Now, let me show you a a chart to kind of illustrate my point. You've heard of Caesar and Plato and Aristotle, and nobody doubts that they lived, and nobody doubts that they wrote books, right? And here's the date in this column as to when the books were written, and here's the earliest copy that we have of those different writings, and then we see the time span. Look at this, Caesar's writings from the, when it was written to the earliest copy, it's a thousand years has gone by. And and then for Plato, it's 1,200 years. For Aristotle, it's 1,400 years. And how many copies of these documents do we have? Well, for Caesar, it's 10. For Plato, it's only 7. For Aristotle's documents, it's only 49. Now, all this got me to thinking. I said to myself, I said, self, I said, yeah. I said, how many Old Testament documents do we have? And how much time between when it was written and, you know, the earliest documents that we have today? Well, I looked it up for you. Aren't you glad? And I found out that in the Old Testament, it used to be 1,300 years. 1,300 years from the time that it was written to the earliest document that we have today. But all that changed in 1947. 1947, there was a shepherd boy. He's a teenager. He's walking up and down a valley one day, and there were caves on the side of the valley. And his dad had told him, go find the lost goat. He was looking for a goat. Dad basically said, don't come back till you bring the goat. So the kid's walking up and down the valley as best he can, trying to find this goat. Well, he gets the idea that maybe the goat went into one of these caves to cool off because the sun was kind of hot that particular day. So he's got this idea to pick up rocks, throw them into caves. He was hoping to scare the goat out of the cave. So he's throwing rocks into one cave after another cave after another cave. He finally throws a rock in one particular cave, and he hears a crash. It's like a clay jar has broke. Well, he's kind of curious about that. So he climbs up the side of the hill, goes into the caves, and there he finds clay jars. And inside those clay jars were seven different scrolls from the Old Testament that dated back now to where there's only a 600-year time gap between when they were written and the earliest documents that we have. These are priceless treasures, these seven scrolls. But the kid doesn't know what he's got, so he goes and he sells them for $97.20. Well, some Bedouin shepherds heard about that you can make $97.20 from finding ancient documents, and so they began to search that region, all the different caves. They found thousands and thousands of fragments of the Old Testament, and they found hundreds of manuscripts of the Old Testament. The greatest find, this is what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls, the greatest find of the Dead Sea Scrolls was we found the book of Isaiah. Let me show you something. Isaiah was written around 750 B.C., The earliest copy we had before the Dead Sea Scrolls was a copy from 900 A.D. That's a lot of years between them, right? Now, because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have a copy from 150 B.C. So from the earliest copy we had before, 900 A.D., to the copy we have now, 150 B.C., there's over 1,000 years between those two documents. So here's what the skeptic said. Skeptic said, listen, put Isaiah from from 900 A.D. next to Isaiah from 150 B.C., and they're not even going to be similar. There's going to be so many additions and subtractions and changes, and you're going to see that what we have today wasn't what we had back then. So the scholars put the two documents side by side. What did they find? They were identical. Now, one of the documents had some spelling errors. They didn't have spell check back then. But they were identical. Sentence upon sentence, line upon line, syllable after syllable, they were identical in every way. Now, you got to ask yourself the question, how is that even possible? Well, this is the Word of God. And God preserved and protected His Word. And He did it through faithful men throughout the years. There were two different groups of people who protected the integrity of Scripture. One was called the Talmudin. They protected the integrity of the Bible from A.D. 100 to A.D. 500. Synagogue scrolls had to be written on specially prepared skins of clean animals and fastened with strings taken from clean animals. Each skin had to contain a certain number of columns. Each column had to have between 48 and 60 lines and be 30 letters wide. The spacing between consonant sections and books was precise. 
measured by hairs or threads. The ink had to be black and prepared with a specific recipe. The transcriber could not deviate from the original in any manner. No words could be written from memory. The person making the copy had to wash his whole body before beginning and had to be in full Jewish dress. The scribe had to be reverently wipe his pen each time he wrote the word God Elohim and wash his entire body before writing God's covenant name for God, which is Yahweh. Do you think these people took the word of God seriously? I would say that they did. Maybe a little more seriously than maybe the likes of maybe you and me. They wanted to protect the integrity of the scripture so that what we had today is what they had back then. But this wasn't the only group that did this. There was also the Masorites. And they oversaw the process from AD 500 to 900. And they adopted an even more elaborate system to make sure that the accuracy of the word of God stayed true. Look at what they did. They numbered the verses, words, and letters of each book. And they calculated the midway point of each one. When a scroll was complete, independent sources counted the number of words and syllables, forward, then backward, then from the middle of the text each direction to make sure that the exact number had been preserved. Proofreading and revision had to be done within 30 days of a completed manuscript. Up to two mistakes were okay on a page. But if there was three mistakes, they had to condemn the whole manuscript. These scribes treated the text so reverently that older manuscripts were destroyed to keep them from being misread. So if, you, if you've ever been to Washington, D.C. and you've seen the Declaration of Independence, you, you see that it's kind of fading, right? It's not what it once was. And it's going to continue to fade until it's completely gone. Well, that was what was happening with the ancient scrolls. So when a scroll began to fade, what would they do? These guys would sit down and they'd make sure it was accurate every way. And then, because they were fearful that the old scroll was becoming to a, a place where you couldn't read it legibly, they were afraid that people would use that old scroll and say it said something that it didn't really say, and then heresy would happen, so they would burn those scrolls. That's why we don't have any of the original manuscripts. So what's the, what's the gap from the Old Testament when it was written to the earliest copy? And what's the gap for the New Testament when it was written and the earliest copy that we have? You ready for this? The Old Testament gap is 600 years. And the New Testament gap is 25. Oh, and how many manuscripts do we have? So far, over 24,000. Why are there so many ancient manuscripts of the Bible? Because they wanted to protect the Word of God, because they knew this book wasn't just any ordinary book. And they wanted to make sure that the next generation could have it, because it's so life-changing. So the first thing you say to the skeptic is, hey, let's just look at the manuscript evidence. It's pretty overwhelming, isn't it? But then we can also go to the archaeological evidence. Here's the, here's the question we ask ourselves. Is there anything that archaeology is finding, archaeologists are finding, that disproves the Bible? Because they're digging all the time. In fact, for Israel, you can't build up until you've dug down. Because they love their ancient history, so they always dig down before they build up to make sure they're not building on something that would be of you know, archaeological significance. So are they finding anything that disproves the Word of God? Well, let me, let me give you a, a few that they said over the years. One, they said Sodom and Gomorrah never existed. They said Sodom and Gomorrah never existed because they couldn't find any artifacts or any remains of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, you know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Their sin was so great that God sent burning sulfur from heaven above and obliterated those two cities. Friends, there's a reason why we can't find any archaeological evidence of where the cities were. Because when God wipes something from the face of the earth, it is wiped from the face of the earth. So this is what they said. Scholars said, well, no such thing as Sodom and Gomorrah. Can't find a stitch of evidence that those two cities ever existed. That's a fairy tale. That story's a myth. It never happened. Well, we kept digging. And they came across 1,700 clay tablets. They're merchant records. Merchant records where they would go from one town to another town to another town, and they would do their business. They would wear, buy and sell their goods at the different towns. And wouldn't you know it, I can't read this, so I don't know where it's at, but on this document, on this document is Sodom and Gomorrah. And not just on this one, it's on over 1,700 tablets. And now we say, well, I, I guess there really were two cities called Sodom and Gomorrah. The skeptics also said for years that David never existed. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, this is a problem for us. 
because David is mentioned over a thousand times in the Bible. And if David never existed, if he's just a fictional character, then we got a lot of the Bible to rip out. There's nothing more than a lie. It's a myth. It's a fairy tale. So did David actually exist? Well, we kept digging. And you know what we found? We found the ancient city of Jerusalem that David built. That's pretty convincing, isn't it? We also found David's palace. That's pretty convincing. We also found this 3,000-year-old monument that said the house of David. They also said that the Philistines never existed. There's over 2,000 references to the Philistines. Saul fought the Philistines. David fought the Philistines. Solomon fought the Philistines. Samson fought the Philistines. If the Philistines never existed, we are in serious trouble. Take those parts of the Bible out. Well, they kept digging. This is the Philistine temple right here. We also found documentation about this is how the Philistines gathered together for battle and for war against their enemies. This is the suit of armor that they wore. They also said that the Hittites never existed. There's 50 references to the Hittites. Skeptics said they never existed. We can't find a shred of evidence. But now we've unmasked thousands and thousands of manuscripts that talk about the Hittite people. And they span, are you ready for this? They lived on this earth for over 1,200 years. Isn't that something? Let me give you another one. These are anchors. Acts chapter 27, Paul talks about heading to Rome. And on his way to Rome, he is shipwrecked right off St. Thomas Bay, right off of Malta. And so uh, there was a storm, and they had to lighten the ship. And so they threw all the cargo out. And then he was very specific that they cut the four anchors. Where well, archaeologists were very interested to find these four anchors. But St. Thomas Bay Malta today wasn't St. Thomas Bay Malta back then. And so when archaeologists finally figured out where it was, then they went off the coast about the same distance that Paul said to, and guess what they found? <laughs> they found the four anchors. They found the walls of Jericho that came tumbling down. I saw them with my own eyes. They found the burial box of Caiaphas, the high priest that Jesus was brought before for his trial, before his crucifixion. They found inscriptions related to Pontius Pilate, the fifth governor of the Roman Judea, also a key player in the trial and crucifixion of Jesus. We found Peter's house. You can go to Peter's house if you go to Israel. Maybe they'll give you some tea. We found Nazareth, the hometown of Jesus. We found the pool of Bethesda where Jesus healed a man who was paralyzed. We found the town of Bethany. This is where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. I, I wish that COVID hadn't messed up my trip to Israel. I was so excited to go back to Israel and see the sights and sounds. If you ever get a chance to go to Israel after all this stupid stuff has passed us by, and you get a chance to go, your Bible will absolutely come alive. You, you can walk in the valley where David took on Goliath. You can climb the mountain where Elijah called down fire from heaven. You can stand on the side of the Sea of Galilee in this mountain range where Jesus fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Most scholars estimate there was 15 to 20,000 people there on that particular day when Jesus taught. And he took five loaves of bread and two small fish, and he multiplied it, and he fed every single one of them. I was always kind of skeptical about that passage of Scripture, to be honest with you. I wasn't skeptical that Jesus could do the miracle. Obviously, Jesus can do anything. He can make five loaves of bread and two fish into a gourmet meal for anybody that he wants to, for as many people as he wants to. The thing that I saw miraculous was the fact that everyone could hear him. You know, for, for me to have you hear me right now, i got to talk in this Britney Spears microphone. You understand what I'm saying? That's jacked up. You understand that? I look stupid in this thing. You know what I mean? But that's what I got to wear so you didn't hear me. Imagine a space where 15 to 20,000 people can hear it without any microphone system. So I was a little skeptical. So when I got to Israel, I wanted to ask the tour guide, here we are in the space. I said, this is the spot. He said, this is the spot. I, I said, is it, is it acoustically sound? He said, absolutely acoustically sound. Because I said, I have a hard time believing that Jesus could just talk naturally and all these people could hear him. He said, you want me to prove it to you? I said, absolutely. He jumped over the barrier, ran about 300 yards away from me. That's three football fields. He turned around. He said, can you hear me now? No, he didn't use the Verizon commercial. That was just for fun. That was just for fun. He said, Todd, can you hear me? And he was talking in his normal voice. And I said, yeah. It was like God said, I'm going to make this space. It's going to be acoustically sound. And Jesus is going to come. And he's going to do this miracle. And he's going to teach these people about the kingdom of God. And everyone can hear what is being said. 
You, you, you can go on a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee and you can cruise across the water that Jesus walked on, that Peter walked on briefly. Uh, you can go to the uh, temple steps. They just unearthed the temple steps about 10 years ago. The temple steps where Jesus chased the money changers out. I, I've got a rock in my office from those steps. No one said I couldn't take it, so I did. <laughs> I'm just confessing my sin. That's all I'm doing right now. But it's in my office. It's way cool, okay? You can, you can go to the Garden of Gethsemane. That was the coolest place of all. There's olive trees that are over 3,000 years old. Those trees were there when Jesus was there. And you can sit under that tree and you can open up your Bible and you'll have a moment with God unlike anything you've ever had before in your life. You can walk the Via Della Rosa, the way of the, the cross. You can take the very footsteps that Jesus took as he carried his cross for the sins of all mankind. And you can go to the place where the empty tomb is and you'll find a sign on the door. It says, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Friends, there has never been an archaeological discovery that has disproven your Bible. And they're still digging to this day. So we look at manuscript evidence, we look at archaeological evidence, we also look at fulfilled prophecy. I I don't know if you understand this or not, but your Bible is a supernatural book. It predicts the future with uncanny accuracy. In fact, whenever the Bible predicts the future, it always comes true. Now, even weather people can't pull that off, can they? I mean, that storm last night, like, no one saw that one coming, right? It just poured here. I don't know if it poured at your place, but it poured here during the 4 o'clock service. It's like God was saying, yes, I can do what I want to do, but you know nothing. (laughs) Let me show you this cool verse of Scripture. I think this is so neat. Isaiah chapter 46, God says, I am God, and there's no other. I am God, and there's none like me. I make known the ends from the beginning, from ancient times. What is still to come, I say, my purpose will stand. And I will do all that I please. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. So God calls a shot in the Bible. He calls it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. One of the things that he prophesies about in the Old Testament is the coming of the Messiah. You see, God knew that there was going to be a bunch of wannabes. A bunch of people that would proclaim to be the Messiah. And so God said, listen, when you find the person who fulfills these prophecies, then you have the right Messiah. And there's over 300 prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. Scholars say there's 61 major prophecies and then these others are what we call minor prophecies. So let's just focus for a second on the 61 major prophecies. When you find the person who's done these things, then you found the right Messiah. Let me just show a couple of them to you. Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7 says the Messiah would be born child and would establish an eternal kingdom. Isaiah 7 14 says the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Psalm 72 verse 9 says the Messiah would be worshipped by shepherds and kings who would bring him gifts of gold. Micah 5 2 says the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. It gets very specific about the death of Jesus. It talks about the fact that he'll be sold for a certain amount of money, that they'll gamble for his clothing, that none of his bones will be broken. In Isaiah, it says that his hands and his feet will be pierced. Written a thousand years before crucifixion even became a means of execution. How in the world did Isaiah know that Jesus' hands and feet would be pierced when crucifixion wasn't even invented yet as a means of executing people? And yet that's exactly how Jesus died. On and on and on and on it goes. Now, statisticians got together and they did their statistician work. And I don't know how all that works out, but the question was this How do we know for certain? I mean, what's the odds of someone pulling something like this off? Well, the probability of Jesus fulfilling just eight of the 61 major prophecies, according to statisticians, is 10 to the 17th power, or this number right there. Did, Jesus didn't fulfill eight. He fulfilled all 61. In fact, he didn't just fulfill all 61. He fulfilled the major prophecies and every one of the minor prophecies as well. Over 300 total. And you doubt whether he's the Messiah? You doubt whether he's the King of Kings and he's the Lord of Lords? Jesus called his own shot, didn't he? Jesus predicted that Jerusalem would fall. 
And didn't it? A.D. 70, General Titus comes in. Jesus said that not one stone would be left on top of the other. And that's exactly what Titus did. He came in and he burned all the stones because they were encased in gold. He melted all the gold and he turned over every single stone just as Jesus said would happen. There's a little prophecy uh, in the Bible concerning the coming of Israel. It says that Israel will vanish and then in one day it will return. Well, after A.D. 70, Israel vanished. There was no nation of Israel for thousands of years. And then in 1947, 1948, Harry S. Truman signed that the United States would, uh, would back Israel as a nation. And Israel was born in one day. And friends, that's a major prophecy for the coming of the Son of God, for the second coming of Jesus. And it happened in 1947, 1948. He just calls it shot again and again and again. You're looking for truth? Where do you look for truth? You look for it in your newspaper because you won't find it there. You look for truth on the internet? Come on. There's no truth on the internet. You better fact check everything you read about on the internet. But you want truth. You want something that's current and relevant, even more relevant than all the information they're trying to feed you? Open up the Word of God. Because the word of God is truth, and everything he said is coming true. So you need to pay attention to it. You need to read it. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21 says, And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you would do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shine in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You have a supernatural book in your possession. Are you just going to let it collect dust? Or are you going to start studying this thing and applying this thing to your life? So let me give you the fourth evidence to the reliability of the Bible, and that's changed lives. Listen, my, my life was changed by reading this book. I, I don't know if you know my story. If you're an old-timer, you've heard my story a million times. I was sitting in typewriting class. That's when we had typewriting class. Isn't that funny? We used to have typewriting class. Now a baby comes out of the womb and just immediately starts texting. It's the most amazing thing you've ever seen. It's like it's a second nature to them, right? But back then, we had to learn the keyboard. We had to learn how to type. I was sitting next to this girl, and I was being crass. I was being dirty. I was talking some noise to her. And a guy by the name of Bill Hill, he turned around, and he said, Hey, Todd, I'd like to tell you how you can become a Christian. Well, I thought I was a Christian. The reason I thought I was a Christian is because I went to church all the time. I went on Sunday morning, and if we didn't do it right, we went back on Sunday night to try again. And then we had service on Wednesday night because I needed a shot in the arm, my mom said, for the midweek, too, because I was a you know, pretty messed up person. So I said to Bill Hill, I said, Bill Hill, Bill Hill, Bill Hill. I go to church all the time, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I'm a Christian. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, why don't you act like it? And it crushed me. And I went home, and I thought, I need to find out what this is all about. Because I'd never read the Bible before for myself. So I found a Bible under my bed. It was a King James Version of the Bible. And I began to read it. Where far art thou, you fart, I'll fart with you, and we'll fart together. That's what it said, basically. <laughs> I mean, he said to me at all, like, what? So I called out. I said, Mothereth, Mothereth, could you help with meeth understand? <laughs> and so my mom came in. She said, I have no idea what to tell you with about this if. She called my preacher. The preacher said, get him an NIV Bible. We recommend the New Living Translation of the Bible. But I got an NIV Bible, 1984 edition, and I began to read it. I said, Mom, where do I start? She said, start with the book of John. So I read the book of John. I couldn't put it down. He, the words on that page were just screaming out at me. And I saw my need for, for a Savior. I saw my need for my sin and that I couldn't pay my sin debt myself, and that Jesus had come to pay that debt. I got to John chapter 14, and Jesus said this. He says, if you love me, you'll obey me. And I knew I didn't love him because I wasn't obeying him. So I knew I wasn't a follower of his because I never got around to actually following him. So I got on my knees by my bed, and I asked Jesus to come in my life. Just, just, just out of curiosity, you can play along at home, you can play here in this room. How many of us would say your, your life was changed by the word of God? Anybody? Anybody at all? Yeah, that's most of us, right? Some would say, what well, was a preacher? But in reality, it was a preacher teaching you what? The 
the Word of God. And, and then how did you really grow as a Christian? Did you grow by coming to church week after week after week, listening to this extremely attractive young man up here? Is that how you, you did? Maybe I helped you a little bit, but you know when you really start growing is when you get the daily discipline to read that book yourself. And all of a sudden, every day God's talking to you. Every day God's leading you. Every day God is guiding you. This is, this is no ordinary book, is it? Isn't it interesting, all around the world, people are gathering together to study this book. You don't, you don't see that for Moby Dick, do you? You don't see any buildings being erected for Moby Dick. Like, this is the church of Moby Dick. You know what I mean? No, we do. Week after week, as we just study Moby Dick. We love Moby Dick. Oh, Moby Dick. Moby Dick. We sing songs to Moby Dick. That's what we do. We memorize passages to When my soul is empty and I'm craving something more, I want Moby Dick. That's what I want, Right? Hey, no slam to Moby Dick. I, I'm told that it's a classic. I've never read it, not planning on ever reading it either. I'll tell you that right now. But when your soul is empty, when you need nourishment, when you need direction, when you didn't know that everything's going to be okay, where do you turn? You turn to the Word of God. And why do we turn to the Word of God? Well, the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the divine of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart, doesn't it? So what, what are you going to do with it? The whole hope of this thing was that we would become people of the book, that we would do devotionals, that we would study the Word of God, that we would read the Word of God, that we would memorize the Word of God, we would apply the Word of God, that we would use the Word of God for every decision we make in our life. Life is much easier when you just do what God wants you to do. And every time you have a regret is when you did the direct opposite. I did the direct opposite of what God's Word revealed for us to do. So what, what are you going to do? Because the Bible is the truth, the whole truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me, God. You going to let it sit in that drawer? You going to let it sit on that nightstand, collect dust? Or are you finally going to break it open? You finally going to open up that app that's been updated so many times, but since it's been updated, you've not touched it because that little blue light is still there telling you that it's been updated. But you have, would you finally open it up? And would you finally start reading and letting your life be changed? By God's holy word. I pray that you will. Let's talk to God right now. Dear Heavenly Father, may we be people of your book. May we study it and memorize it and meditate upon it. God, thank you for the evidence that shows us that what we have today is what we had way back then. Thank you that your word is alive. And that you speak to us through your holy word. And that you want to guide us into the best life possible. Lord, I pray for friends who are here today. I pray, God, that they would study your word and apply your word. They would spend more time in your word than they do on Netflix or on the internet or surfing or doing whatever else they do on the computer. God, that they would seek your truth and your wisdom. We need it now more than ever before because we've been given so much misinformation. We've been told so many lies that are contrary to your word. God, may we learn your word. May we apply your word. May we love your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, some of you are here today, and uh, you're waiting on asking Jesus to come into your life. And the reason you're waiting is you want to get all your questions answered first. Well, hopefully I just answered a question for you right there, didn't I? about the Word of God and the reliability. And you're like, well, that checks that one off. I say, that's accurate. But what about this, Todd? And what about this? And what about this? Can I let you know a little secret? If you wait till you get all your questions answered, you will never give your life to Jesus. I've been a Christian now for 40 years. I still have questions. I don't have everything figured out. But I don't worry so much about what I don't understand. What I'm more concerned about is what I do understand. And my guess is that you already understand enough to give your life to Christ. My guess is you already believe that the Bible is the Word of God. My guess is you already believe that God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sins and that he rose again from the dead. And now it's just time for you to finally surrender and say, I want Jesus to come to my life. If you want to talk to a pastor about that, 
Right after we're done with this service, all you have to do is go into our first steps room. It's room 111. There's a picture of what it looks like. There's pastors there. There's people there that would love to talk to you. You say, oh, Todd, I'm not, I'm not ready to make that decision, but I do have some questions. Can I go there and ask my questions? Absolutely. You go in there and you say, I'm not sure about this, or I'm not sure about that. Can I have a conversation about this with you? They're not going to say, oh, man, you're such a loser. Did you not listen to Todd today? They're not going to do that. They might want to, but they're not going to, okay? It's just joking. Listen, we're all there. We all have the same questions. Maybe we have some answers. Maybe we have some answers that would help you draw closer to Jesus. It's worth the conversation. And if you don't feel comfortable going to that room, you can call or text me at 505-922-9200. And I'll tell you what, we'll immediately respond to you. And we want to have that conversation. We want to help you any way we possibly can so that you might have a relationship with Jesus Christ because he's made such an amazing difference. It's the word of God. It's Jesus and the power of his Holy Spirit that spurs us on to be the men and the women, the husbands and the wives, the the moms and the dads that we all long to be. So if you're interested, you want to talk to somebody, there's two options for you. I hope that you'll take one of those two options. Well, I hope that you guys have a wonderful Father's Day today. Dads, make sure on your way out you get your dad's mug and you tell everybody else keep their hands off of it, okay? Have a great day. I'll see you next week. Find out about what it means to follow Jesus by calling 505-922-9200. A member of our pastoral team wants to connect with you. You can also visit sagebrush.church connect and someone will be in touch with you soon. If you haven't heard yet, this summer we have even more exciting things ahead for all of our kids and students at Sagebrush. X Camp and Remix Rally are back for 2021 and better than ever. Spaces are filling up fast, so make sure to register your student now at sagebrush.church slash xcamp and sagebrush.church slash rally. On Friday, June 25th, Sagebrush Music is excited to release our version of Waking Up by We the Kingdom. It will be available everywhere and you can listen to the music this Friday, June 25th. Thanks for spending some time with us. Have a great week.